This is Boxing Tickets NA, and we're joined with the main man of Boxing Ireland promotions, Leonard Gunnan. Hi, are you, Leonard? How are you, How are you getting on, pal? You all right? Or, I think we'll start pronouncing you as Uncle Len, because you've obviously the moustache and everything else going, so you're like, you're like, yeah. you, you're like Ireland's version of, of Frank Warren, nearly everybody's uncle. Um, didn't Frank Warren get shot? Yeah, we'll not go that far then, will we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, so, definitely not. Uh, yeah. things with you? Yeah, good, good, yeah. Got the uh, Luxembourg show just out of the way now. So, um, just got um, actually doing a bit of my actual work at the moment. That's what I'm focusing on at the moment. But then, you know, we've got a few other things to uh, announce over the next couple of weeks. So, I'm looking forward to that. And Stephen's preparing stuff as well. And loads going on. New signings, all sorts. And I'm guessing there's obviously more, it's more relief to be back promoting boxing. Obviously, it's, you know, 13 months since obviously these are the last show in Belfast. And as the pandemic was sort of starting to hit, everybody was like two months we're back to normal, you know, but yeah. thir 13 months down the line. Obviously, no, you tried yeah. to show in January in Spain, yeah. but obviously because of the pandemic, it couldn't happen. But it's obviously yeah. a relief now that Luxembourg's done and dusted and you can put a tick mark. Finally, 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 we got one over the line because uh, like when it, it sort of got real around last March, didn't it? We had a show planned for Belfast in May, wasn't it? End of, end of May, end of May, yep. and so obviously that got scrapped. But we weren't too panicked about it. We just said, "Oh, okay. back for the end of the year." Like you say, everyone thought it was just that little carrot in front of you that you kept going for. But another lockdown, another lockdown. But then we we decided to get a behind closed door pay per view model in Dublin do mm -hmm. it in a boxing gym but BUI said no they're not going to they're not going to have these medics available when there's a pandemic so it would send out the wrong signal and also it was financially going to be massively unviable because we, we would have, have had to do a, a bubble sort of scenario a bit like the match room thing mm -hmm. which you know unless you've got a massive contract with Sky that's unfeasible which is why no even there's not been any small ball boxing in uh, in the UK at all over the last year mm -hmm. there's, I think there's one show one show that they did Sheffield one show yeah. happened in, in Liverpool was it I think or something like that Sheffield the drive-in show oh yes yes the drive-in show yeah so uh, yeah drive-in yeah I don't, how did it work how did it go? How did that one go? It was um, your man. It was bloody, what's his name? Dennis Hobson. Dennis Hobson. Yeah. Dennis Hobson. Yeah. Fair play to him. Dennis is always an innovator anyway. Um, I'm not sure how well it went. Um, but fair play to him for being innovative because he's the only one that's actually put a show on in Britain Any uh, that that isn't aligned with either a big promoter or mm. a TV company. Fair play. Yep, exactly. He's tried something. Um, obviously, getting getting out in the Luxembourg's obviously great. You five fires in action. I obviously have to ask, what did you think of obviously the show and as a whole? Uh, the promoter was very easy to work with. Great lad, Yasin. Uh, very helpful. It was very difficult plan to plan it. Very difficult to plan it because you're going multiple countries. You know. And then your transfer and flights are transfer, and then and the, the opponents are come from other countries, and you're ha you're trying to learn the COVID rules of like four countries for just one fighter, you know. Mm -hmm. And then obviously there's other fighters as well, so it was actually actually a fucking bit of a melter to be honest with you. Um, but we got there. It happened. So that's the that's the main thing. So that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be in a rush to go back to Luxembourg, though. Um, I, there's not many shows in Luxembourg. I don't think the officials were massively experienced. Mm -hmm. There was lots of weird things that happened. Every fight that seemed to have something, even the ones like obviously we lost with Dominic mm -hmm. one, we'll talk about that in a minute. But there was some, there was stuff wrong with every, nearly every fight. Yeah nearly every fight like the, even before the, the first couple of fights they weren't our guys and we, we were there like 
dump, I was there, like don't put the gloves on, don't put the hand. All the lads were hand, were in the first half of the show. Put the hand wraps. They had their hand wraps done. I said, don't put the gloves on yet, lads. We'll get them signed off by the commission. So I went down looking for the commissioner. He said, no, no. We we look at the we inspect their hand wraps after the fight. So what? Well, like, that doesn't make any sense. So someone goes in there with loaded gloves. He smashes you to bits, and then you look at them after. It's just weird. I know some amateur organizations do it. So that that's that alarm bells. This that seems like it. They do that in the amateurs, and that's what they that's what they did. They they, they make you talk, take the gloves off, and then they check your hand wraps in the ring. All right, that's a bit weird. So then, first fight was Jamie Morrissey. So he went down, caught your man with a big left hand, opened his eye up, and then his corner were looking for an old contest. And I was like, no, mate, no, no, that's, that's not happening. And then your man came out at him again, and Jamie weathered the fight very well. And then they the doctor, I think the doctor pulled him out or the corner pulled him out or whatever. And I and I thought they were going to call a no contest on that. Mm-hmm. And I, I was like, this, this, he's after hitting him with a punch. So we all started screaming at him. It was a, it was a punch. It was a punch. You probably heard it on the screen. It yeah. was a punch. It was a punch. And uh, then the referee seemed to change his mind to saying it was a TKO because it was caused by a punch. And so that was like a relief that he like, gave that. But that, but that. but that was another alarm bell. Like what? That was on indecisive. Like he should have said that straight away. Cut was caused by a punch. It's a, it's a technical knockout. That's mm-hmm. it done. So I was a bit worried there, but like fair play to Jamie Morrissey. He actually, he is his first pro fight. He hasn't got a massive amount of boxing experience. You know, he's from my Thai background. He's fucking massive at the weight. Mm. Absolutely massive at the weight. Really gamey, really aggressive. But he was patient as well in the ring. And the size of him as well, he was just able to take your man off. Like, those little bits that he needs to learn, you know, um, cutting the ring off, not letting the opponent be able to walk away from you when he's in trouble, uh, not coming in the straight lines and coming out in straight lines. Just, but that's experience. That'll come. Yeah. That'll come. He showed so much stuff, that positive stuff, that you think, right? Just he needs a wee bit more. Just needs time with a coach there, which he's getting now. So and more sparring, and experience, and he'll be, he'll, he'll be a right. He's a right handful, right handful. But your man came out after he got the cut, and the, and the doctor was about to stop it. Your man came out for the next, you know, minute and threw everything at him, and he. He rode that well, you know. He could have got panicked, took his chin up in the air, got clipped. You know, he didn't. He he took his time, picked his shots, and came away with a really, really good, really good win. Started off your career. It's nice to get it. Nice to get a stoppage on your uh, on your record straight out the straight out the gate. And it was it was your man was a tough guy. Your man was a tough guy. Adnan mm-hmm. Zilla, she's probably decent enough guy for a debut. And. Uh, Let's see how he goes, but he's a, he's very early with it, very early. You know, he's he's a little older than than your average debutant, but it's early doors for him really. And I like this, just get him a few more four rounders, build his experience. But seems like a popular guy as well because him and Owen, who we'll talk about next, where they they got massive amount of views on the on the stream. Mm-hmm. So yeah. And I'd say, obviously, I know from, from interviewing Jamie the other week and things like that as well, he, he's been very respectful of regardless who he's going to fight. You know, he's not thinking of the opponent he's fighting to journeyman. It's just there to lie down. He's given everybody the respect. And coming from a, from a, a different grade of combat sports, he has to be patient on it as well because he'd probably be the first to admit and go, I could have done this better, I could have done that better. But he seems keen and no. eager and he wants to progress. We we've had uh, over the last couple of months we've it's probably probably from him turning over pro and other guys sort of seen it as well. We've had probably about six or seven Mai Tai K one kickboxing type guys all ask us to turn pro. And before I probably would be would, wouldn't have given them much time. Just said no, mm-hmm. let's listen. It's not for you. But the the guy that actually changed my mind for this was Stephen McAfee. You know, he came from that background and was a kickboxing background, and and I was actually not didn't want him on the on the first Celtic clash. 
uh, with with Tony David, and I was like, Steve, well, Stephen, Stephen Sharp had convinced me to actually put him on the show, mm. and he was one of the best. He was, we was in the end, he was actually one of the best on the show, and he's been fantastic on the Celtic last year and over the last few years. So yeah, me, me, I, my mind is a wee bit more open to these guys are fighters. I don't know how far they'll go, but they actually, they know the game. They're just transferring their skill set. That's going to take a bit of time. And also, it actually brings... Their defence probably isn't as good as guys that are schooled a long time. But they're pretty aggressive. And that actually makes for good fights. Yeah. I've seen a bit of... of Jamie's obviously fights and, and I keep calling it Muay Thai. And then I think I've got an accent. <laughs> I can't yeah. say the word right. I don't know if... Uh, the last couple of weeks, I think I've, I've new words now have come into my vocabulary yeah. that... I'm like, I can't say these words anymore because I don't use them. Um, but Jamie's always been used to selling tickets and things like that as well. So the yeah. good thing for him is he's, he's used to the model of what he has to do. Yeah, he's used to that model. Yeah, and, and I don't think there'll be a problem there. Like, uh, like I say, going, going by the reaction, the stuff that we put out, out on social media about him, I think he'd be probably a, a pretty strong, pretty strong marketable mm-hmm. guy. And it's new, new eyes to the sport as well. Because obviously fans that maybe just wouldn't support him for what yeah. he'd done before, and now you come and watch yeah. more boxing and hopefully become. Well, we first we first sort of got into that sort of territory when we did that show with Martin Horgan and Cork, mm-hmm. you know, and that was a, like a full Mai Tai show on before the boxing show, so we got to see quite a lot of the Mai Tai from that. And honestly, it's bloody brutal sport, man. It's brutal. It is. Oh my god, they really. Oh, oh. <laughs> Hold your yeah, sins and fear. Oh man, Jesus! They open each other up. They open each other up. They're, you know, they're in bits. They're in bits mm-hmm. after these fights, you know. So I was happy when the pro boxing started. My, my, my heart rate could, uh, could could go down a bit, but I tell you what, that or my type fellas, they're they're bred tough. So mm-hmm. I, I can see a lot more of them coming across because you get you get better opportunities in boxing, you know, and you get you get much more media coverage. Then like nobody covers my tie. Nobody mm-hmm. covers my tie. No, no, I don't know any paper or anything like that would cover my tie. Whereas if it's pro boxing, everyone covers pro boxing. You know, so that makes a big difference for these kind of guys. You know, especially you know when they're trying to shift tickets and they need, you know, not, not just their mates that buy tickets, but you know people from their town or their county or their area or whatever. So I can see a lot more guys coming across. And, and obviously, you know, with Jimmy, that's him off and running now. Um, if, if obviously there wasn't controversy in that fight, um, Owen O'Neill's, um, Owen O'Neill was yeah. second up and like the first punch of the fight. Was, was, was first a punch of the fight. Well, I think, again, naivety from the, from the referee wasn't switched on enough, wasn't decisive enough. He should have just, like, it was actually a lovely shot. I watched it back a couple of times mm-hmm. and just, like, caught him with a lovely shot. Sort of looping shot, caught him flush, and he went. He stumbled back, put his hand. He might have put two hands down. He might he definitely mm-hmm. put one on the ground. I was there like, that's a touchdown. I was like, you should have counted that. And uh, so he let that away. I don't know why he let that away. That was perfectly. It was probably because it was so early and, and he wasn't ready for it, you know. Mm-hmm. But he should be. That's his job. And then he was he was uh, stopping the fight for like uh, slapping. You know, saying he's hitting him with the inside. He wasn't hitting him with the inside glove. He wasn't hitting him with the knuckle. He was hitting him sort of flush with that part of the glove. But it's not. It's not like a, it wasn't a slap. Like it, those kind of things are generally let ride in pro boxing. You know, mm-hmm. you don't in, in amateur boxing. These things are pulled up. You know, technique like that is pulled up. But it wasn't a slap. Like it wasn't the inside of the glove. It was the top end of the glove. He was hitting, hitting him with the punch. And he's pulled him on that for a couple of times, and that was that was starting to annoy me as well. So I, the, the the alarm bells were really ringing there, you know. It's like the hand wrap thing couldn't, wasn't decisive on calling the uh, the knockdown, wasn't decisive calling the the, the the knockout for Jamie, and then the slap thing. I was like, these officials are a little. I'm getting worried. I was getting worried at that stage about the officials, um, but on. In terms of own, he looked brilliant. I thought he looked brilliant. You know, uh, compared to Floyd Mayweather, obviously he looks shite. He's mm-hmm. so got a million miles away from that style. 
and that technique and he's got so much more to learn but compared to like his last few fights and even his like his third fight his technique is is vastly improved he is probably our most improved boxer over the lockdown you know even his body shape has changed he looks fitter he's not lost a massive amount of weight so he's obviously lost sort of fat and gained mm -hmm. muscle because he looks like a different man but he is chipping that weight is chipping down so he is going towards welterweight he's only you know that's where he'll be that's where he'll be fighting your titans but there's no rush with him because he's learning he's learning the gym there with Dan and and uh, D and he's got great lads in there top quality fellas there so he's got a lot more learning to do but if it if the trajectory keeps continuing he's going to be a bloody good fighter and I know he's underestimated by some guys and mm -hmm. other guys love the I, I probably we've probably had more call outs for him and phone calls for, for fights for him than all of our stable put together so you know people are obviously tagging him but they'll get a shot when, once he's the once he's the final product they'll get a shot they'll get a real shot do you think do you think that people fall into that trap and I know like the very first interview I've ever done with him you know, he, he said straight away I don't want to be known as a ticket seller I want to be I want to be known for obviously my boxing ability and it annoys him there probably be people of that opinion of him think he's a ticket seller so yeah I think, think he's over that always have come because of that because they know the, and then he showed that people want to sell tickets of course the call out's coming because of his popularity do you know what I mean why do you think people call out Conor Ben yeah you know they say alright you know now that's the most boring thing in boxing is calling out for Conor Ben every man and his dog's done that you know uh, he's high profile and he shouldn't be ashamed of being a ticket seller Mm -hmm. Ricky Hatton was a ticket seller. Yeah. You know, one of the most popular boxers in, in, in British boxing history. You know, Josh Warrington is a ticket seller. Yeah. He's Carl now... Carl Frumpton Carl Frumpton Frumpton. Carl Frumpton. Yeah, well, Carl wasn't a massive ticket seller to begin with. Wasn't a massive ticket seller to begin with. He developed into it. I'll tell you, Eddie Hearn made him a ticket seller. Mm -hmm. you know, obviously, Barry did an unbelievable job managing him no one could take that away from Barry but it, it was Eddie that turned him into the, into the attraction you know um, put him up, putting him on the Odyssey was his first few fights under on the undercards of Paul McCluskey mm -hmm. not, not 100% sure but I, it was that time that then he became like bloody the momentum started coming you know um, but he wasn't originally a ticket seller don't think he was originally a ticket seller but he was a big personality and he's probably the most popular boxer in Ireland. But he's not originally a ticket seller. Um, who else? There's this, that guy in Stoke. You know that guy in Stoke? Nathan, is it Nathan Heaney? Nathan yeah. Heaney? Nathan Healy? Stoke, he's a yeah. ticket. Yeah, look, at, he's a ticket seller and look at the attention he's getting now. And he gets signed with Frank Warren bringing. because of that? Yeah, and, and Frank Warren's on about putting the show on in Stoke purely because of his ticket selling capacity. So I could easily, I could easily see on headlining Ulster Hall and Solitude. you might not, you might not like it and I might not like it, but a, a, a full of Cliftonville fans singing Cliftonville songs. And I know his dream, yeah. it won't be in Solitude as well. So can you imagine me and you having to stand in Solitude with Cliftonville fans? I know, I know, <laughs> I know, you know, yeah. It's not happening. <laughs> you know, I, I, no, listen, I have a great respect for, for uh, lads that uh, support their uh, local team in Ireland because it's, uh, it's not as glamorous as uh, a support in other teams. So fair play to them. And fair play to the support that Cliftonville actually gave him. Like they, they tweeted out the photograph after his win and stuff like that. Congratulations and all that. And uh, that's great to see. You know, I, put, I tweeted out, you know, local club, local club supporting local guy who supports local club. That's the kind, like, again, yeah. that's the whole thing that Boxing Ireland's about. You know, it is about, you have to be a hometown hero to be, to get, to be a world hero, really. You know, it has to, you have to be the hero in your home, hometown first. Mm -hmm. Everything radiates out from that. It all builds on that foundation. And if you if you skip that bit, it's actually very difficult for you to be 
a big star. It, there's always going to be that foundation that's missing. I think a lot of boxers have, have done that, where they go, they try and go, they try and be big time straight away, and they don't focus on the, sh- the really tough bit, which is actually building the fan base yep. locally. You know, they try and like they try and do outlandish stuff and be silly and act like prima donnas when they haven't actually reached there. But they're doing the fake it till I make it model. Mm. And that's okay. But once you lose, all of that is swept away. And if, if it's not built on a solid foundation, a lot of fighters can uh, find themselves in a lot of trouble. So I'll get back to what I want. He should not be embarrassed about being a ticket seller. That's a, it's not the only thing he is, but he is a good ticket seller and he's popular. And it's not the only thing about him, but it's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's actually it's fucking every other box in Ireland will kill to be well, almost every other boxer in Ireland will kill to be as popular as him. Yep, definitely. And I say if he keeps bringing his talents and his ears doing the, the sky's the limit for him. Yeah, it's like the improvements, the improvements in the ring that that, that I saw uh, were mass. You know, he really. He, his distance, his footwork, and his conditioning were like 30%, 40% better than the last fight he had. So just he just needs to keep going, keep his head down, keep working in the gym with Dee and Dan and, and developing himself. And he will get to that. He will be a headline fighter. And, and, and a lot of that is to do with his popularity, yes. Mm. But it's not something to be ashamed of. It's actually something to be proud of. Definitely is. Um, probably, I think the only fight on the card on Saturday, I think it probably didn't have any controversy. Was probably the fa- <laughs> fireman, fireman Kev. Yes, well, actually, it did have a bit of controversy as well because I thought he was going to call a no contest on this as well because your man got your man got injured. That's uh, right. Or he, or he, or or he sh- was showing an injury to his shoulder, and they were screaming in the other corner. No contest, no contest, and the referee didn't again didn't seem to wasn't decisive enough to like say, "Listen, stop," or I'll send you away from the corner. It, you know, if if he gets if he gets injured in a fight like that, you know, it's still he still loses. You know, yeah. um, it's not something that was if it was an uh, accidental head clash and he opened up like that, then that's a different story. But um, he had just been floored. He'd literally just been floored two seconds later, and then he developed the shoulder injury. Mm-hmm. Just went away, right? You know, but it was uh, the, there's another guy as well, though, a bit like Owen, who has changed his body shape dramatically. He looks like a totally different guy than his debut. His skill set's really improving, his marketability is improving. He's, he's doing everything right. He's a consummate pro. You never need to really worry about what's going on with him, you know. You know. He's doing the right things, and he's, and, and he's a grafter. And like you say, he's got the full time job now with the fire brigade, which is brilliant. Yeah, um, and you know he's training there, and he's also training with his boxing, and he's developing his career. And he's not sitting on his arse. He's actually he, he really makes an effort with his socials, with his local media, with his local radio station, stuff like that. And that translates itself into ticket sales. And then other guys, other guys who think. Oh, I, I couldn't sell any tickets. I like, want. Oh. I was like, well, we arranged a load of interviews for you. Uh, you, it's free to open an Instagram page, a uh, Twitter page, a Facebook page. Yeah, just put up videos of you telling a joke every day, or hitting a speed bag, or going for a walk with your dog. People want to know stuff about you. You know, mm-hmm. how are you going to get yourself out there? Just do and do something. You know, you're not going to get it sitting in home, sitting at home on the couch, worrying about how you're going to t- sell tickets. If you actually don't actually turn that into something, so Kev does that as well as all the other stuff. But he should be—he's almost like a model of how you how you can develop yourself mm. on the small hall scene. Use your local media. Local media is crying out for content. You know, the local radio stations, local papers. Every week they've got a chart. They've got to provide a full paper. You know, mm-hmm. if they can share yeah, someone's success, then that's that's yeah. Make yourself, make yourself, 
make yourself available do something on instagram post the sunset on instagram that you saw like just create content it'll and it'll come it's hard the first bit is the hard bit once you start building up momentum then you start getting interactions and then you start getting ticket sales off it and then you start getting sponsors off it and then all of a sudden you go hey that worked but you gave up on the shit bit which is it's really you know oh i've only got 20 followers well you keep going it'll come tag friends that are more popular you know there's lots of lots of things you can tag us we got 10,000 followers on Instagram, 20,000 on Facebook, you know, 20,000 on Twitter. Tag us. We'll retweet it. People will start seeing your name. And then they'll go, oh, let's have a look at this guy. And they'll, you know, mm. you got to, you got to, uh, it's a snowball. Yeah. And you got to keep rolling the snowball. It's only a tiny snowball at the beginning. By the time you've rolled it down to the bottom of the field, it's massive. So that's what you need to do. You need to create, you need, you need to create that snowball effect, you know. Change your snowball and then ugly. What was that? Change your snowball and then ugly. Roll that's it up it. so much you can build a house out of it. That's it. Yeah, that's it. So he's doing great. He's doing great, Kev. You know, although it's only his third fight. It's only mm -hmm. his third fight, you know. So, and what's he, what's he, I think he might make super middleweight. I think he might make super middleweight, you know. It'll be tight though, I think, with him it'll be tight because he is pretty broad shoulders and pretty tall um, but I think he might just make silver medal weight I don't think there were any rush to get him there you know mm -hmm. he might try and chip a pound or two down you know over the next four fights you might not see him at silver medal weight for like five fights or whatever <laughs> but if he can make if he can make you know once he was 173 in Luxembourg if you if can make 170 for a non-title fight and then then title fight, just that last two pounds. Yeah, I'm, I can say, yeah, he probably will make super middleweight. So there'll be some decent clash stuff there. And he's not shy of, uh, not shy of letting lads know that he wants to fight them. You know, he's obviously had a bit of, bit of a run in with obviously uh, Taylor McGoldrick. It seems they've sort yeah. of had spots with everybody yeah. around the weight. Yeah, and uh, Robert Burke was calling him out last week as well, wasn't he? So there's those fights can happen. Those fights can happen. But, um, you know, Robert's got one fight, two fights. I think, one, th and, uh, one, two. I think, it, I think it's one. One. I think he had another one, but it didn't go on box right. And then uh, Taylor's coming off a loss, so he probably wants to get a win, you know. And then Kevin's only had three fights. So, yeah, listen, let the lads, the lads should fight each other, but it should be for titles. That should be for titles, right? Mm -hmm. um, they're all good enough to be able to win a title so let's at least when they fight each other not have it meaningless like at least the BUI Celtic that would be minimum I would prefer to see them for Irish titles mm -hmm. but let's see how it goes let's see how things go definitely is obviously the probably the most controversy um, in the fight was obviously the next one uh, Dominic Donegan um, yeah. I think we're probably we're both in the opinion sort of afterwards that Dominic had the, the fight four rounds to two yeah, at the time I had four four rounds, one to one, and one round even. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, so it was like the first four, first three rounds definite, fourth round probably, fifth round I had a draw, and sixth round the man definitely won. Right, mm -hmm. that's how I scored it. Now, right, okay, so let's say you take off the round where I thought it was even, and you give it to your man. So four two, and I think that's what, is that what you had as well? Yeah, four two. Yeah, yeah. Other people had it five one. Um, I wouldn't have agreed, wouldn't have disagreed with that. Other people had a three all. I wouldn't actually have even argued with three all. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know that fourth round was still wasn't it wasn't great, but he'd won the first three. So and let's say you gave your man a second three. Fair enough, right? Okay. Difference of opinion there. You know, if, even if it was a majority decision to Dominic, you know, one guy had a draw, and one guy had it one round to, to Dominic, one guy had a two. That's that's the kind of uh, cars that I was expecting to, to see, and then when they when they announced it was him, and like I I, I honestly I don't, I don't know what they were looking at. I genuinely don't know what they were looking at. Like, like it's not like he was from Bel Luxembourg or Belgium, mm -hmm. so you can't. It's not like he was in the home corner, so he just got the nod. 
So like it doesn't, there's no, there's no, no logic to it. And then when I saw this, I said, yeah, can I see the scorecards? So we looked at all the scorecards and one of the judges didn't give Dominic a single round. Mm. Not one round. I was like, well, maybe I, maybe I, like I'm a decent scorer of a, of, of a fight, you know, like I'm scoring, when all my, all the fights that I'm watching, you know, for my guys, I'm scoring them in my head to just see, just to see, is, I mean, are, are we in any danger, you know? And uh, I'm generally right of what mm. scores I want to be. And then, but this one, I thought, like I was comfortable. I was so comfortable. Like he's just he bagged three rounds. Now he's looking a little bit tired. It wasn't a great performance from Dom. Yeah, there are reasons for that. You know, he didn't have a great week and all that. But he still, he still won the fight. You know, um, it was just I couldn't believe it. I couldn't. Be, I honestly couldn't believe it. And then, like I say, when your man didn't give him a single round. That was just, that. Is, that's just stupid. That just no. There's nobody in here that didn't think he won. Didn't win a single round. Yeah, there's nobody. I didn't speak to anyone. And I didn't speak to actually anyone that gave it to. Mila Shanyan and, and fair play to Mila Shanyan he actually made a good fight of it, it was actually, I was actually really enjoying the fight mm. uh, I was enjoying that he was coming forward but kind of getting picked off a wee bit but he kept, kept getting through with stuff like Dominic was catching her on his, on his arms and on the gloves but obviously they just liked the pressure your man just liked the pressure like, but it wasn't he wasn't getting anything like your man was throwing shots against the gloves and then Dominic was coming back and catching him and fair enough, he really faded in the last two, and your man won the last round convincingly. So, so be a fair play to him there. But like, it's just that's not the what I didn't find anyone that didn't have a, at least a draw. And most people had Dominic winning. Some people had it a draw. Nobody had it, your man winning, and then definitely no one had Dominic not winning a single round. So I was re I was. I was livid. I was actually no, I wasn't livid because I was actually just shocked. I was actually like, like kind of stunned because if I thought he was behind, yeah, it's not like me sour grape and it after thinking, oh yeah, I got to come up with some story to say that oh Dom really won. No, if I thought he was losing on that stream, I streamed so you would have heard me. I heard every word I said that night. Yeah, I would have been fucking roaring, roaring at the at and banging the canvas to get Dom to like. You need this last round. You need this. Let's all on this last. What are you doing? You know what I mean. Nothing. I was like just enjoying the last round. Oh, he's, on, he's, get, he's he's under the car share a bit in the last round. I'm glad this is the last round. You know that kind of way. But I was more like he's got four in the bank anyway. But um, well done to Milos Yanyan. There's there's a rematch already agreed. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I've just got to decide whether that's going to be his next fight or the one after. We might have, a, we might do another fight in between and then Yan Yan and again, or we might just go straight back in and fight him again. Because I don't think, I think nine times out of ten, Dominic beats him, you know. But I wouldn't do it in Luxembourg. And I don't think I'd, I'd, I'd be inclined not to go back to Luxembourg because I think that. To not give him a single round is weird. And then the other things that were happening before that, weird. And then there was bits and pieces in Caitlin's fight as well, which which were which were weird. So like even a Caitlin's fight, a Caitlin has had an amazing pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know? Like she's just gone from, oh, oh yeah, that's Caitlin, to like boom, in the consciousness of casuals, fat casual fans. Yeah, main mainstream media, you know, like she had a full page article in the Irish Times uh, on the day of the fight. Like that's a broadsheet, yeah, full page article, the main paper in Ireland. It's like, right, shit, that is brilliant. You know, you're usually looking to try and get bits and pieces in places, but mm -hmm. that doesn't have a full page article in the in the Irish Times doesn't come around very often for Irish fighters so like that was unbelievable and then you had like there was a full page in the sun the, the, the day after about the fight and there was a full page in the Daily Mail I think the Irish Daily Mail as well the day of the fight so like she, she's getting she's gone from like the quiet girl to now like really making an impact and that was all obviously all from the Shadgo fight but I actually 
was more way, was more worried about this fight than I was about the Shadka fight. Mm-hmm. You know, I was there like I wonder, I wonder is Kapinska like just too going to be too experienced, too wily uh, for for Caitlin. You know, she, like at the end of the day, she's only had four pro fights. Like this is a big jump in terms of class, and she didn't lose a second of any round. I know, and, 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 and that judge, that judge that gave Dominic no rounds actually had two drawn rounds in this. Yeah, and I, I don't know where you get like Kapinski didn't land a glove on Caitlin in any round, and he gave her two drawn rounds. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what that guy. I don't know what like stop. A, a, stop scoring drawing rounds. Yeah, pick a winner. Yeah, it should be mandatory. It's mandatory in a lot of places. It should be mandatory. It's a cop out. Yeah, with his, with his drawing rounds. Um, but like, Caitlin Ray, like, I, I thought Kapinska would be in that fight up until the fifth, and then Caitlin would take over. But by the th- pretty much by the third round, Kapinska had given up. Mm-hmm. And got on her bike, and was just in uh, damage control mode. Yeah, yep. she didn't want to get stopped effectively. Yeah, and again, this was another thing that that I found bizarre from the the officiating. Caitlin had her going, really had her going. Yeah, at one stage, and the referee stopped the fight. I thought he was actually stopping the fight, mm-hmm. but he actually stopped the fight. Brought the pin. This is the middle of the round. Brought Kapinska back to the, the to her own corner to get the, the blood cleaned up from her nose and her mouth. It's like, like where do they do where do they do that? They do that in the amateurs. Mm-hmm. Like I've never seen anyone get stop the action when a fighter's in full flow about to stop a fighter. Stop it and wait, wait a minute. I need to clean your nose. It's like fuck, Jesus. I was like. That's the, that was the final straw. We're never mm-hmm. coming back here. You know, it's just, right, fair enough. They, don't, they probably don't have a lot of shows there. All right, okay. But that's not, I don't have to suffer that. You mm-hmm. know, or just go somewhere else uh, next time. Like, it was just a bit weird. Everything was great, but the officiating then just kind of let it down. And then it was great to have Caitlin get that fight, and especially Caitlin at the new weight. You know, she's she looks she, again a bit like Dominic. Both of the both Dominic and Kate, I mean, not Dominic, but Kevin, Kevin Cronin and mm-hmm. Caitlin both both made their debut on the same show on the Clash of the Titans show. Yeah, and the difference in their physique between then and now, and what is that? Is that three years? Is it three years? Is it what two, it, three years? A bit coming up, I think three years. Yeah, it's true because it was Mar- It was March, was it? Was it March? March eighteen. Twenty twenty fourth of March, twenty eighteen. I oh, saw so three Just years yesterday. Three years yesterday, yeah. Yeah. Um. The the difference in their physique is r- remarkable. You know, they're turning into proper pro athletes. There's still more to go on, both more improvement to go to them. Again, Dominic can. Uh, Kevin can come down a few more pounds. Caitlin will as well, I'm sure. But like, there's no rush with them. They're both young fighters, and like, and they've got loads of time. But when they fight, fight real fights, you know, where they're, it's this fifty-fifty. Like, obviously, going into that fight, you'd make Caitlin the seventy-thirty favorite. Yeah. So when these fights are fifty-fifty, you want every advantage you can. Mm-hmm. So she'll be at least lightweight and maybe even further on down her career she could be super featherweight but we're working towards that we're in no rush to lose that weight because she's developing as a fighter and she's her physique is developing her shape is, is changing as well you just see she looks more like a fighter and when she's so young she has so much time to develop as well so you, the, you, the last thing you want to do is rush that yep. so you just, it, it's careful matchmaking getting her the right fight with the right people and still keeping her keeping her interested so that it's a decent fight so it's a real balancing act there you know but you've the thing with her you've got 
you've got a lot of time and I'm I'm pretty sure she's going to become a, a, a world champion of one of the the recognised um, federations mm-hmm. sanctioned bodies you know just it has to happen like if you go you go into the top 10 in her division it's like the the average age is probably nearly 40 mm-hmm. the women in the top 10 yeah She's twenty. Like she's got a twenty-year head start on these girls. Yeah. Like, you know, it's it's amazing. It's it's amazing what she's doing so early in her career, and it's actually one. That's actually the one of the the, the hard things that she's actually jumped too far ahead. It's almost like it's like, oh, well, wait a minute, we got to fill in a couple of the gaps here. Got to fill in. You know, you haven't fought a big tall girl at Southpaw. You haven't fought. You know, you need to. You know. You haven't fought like a Mexican. You haven't fought a someone that's a counter puncher. You, you, you know you need to you need to fight all those people as you step up the stairs to success. Yeah, mm-hmm. and she's she's jumped up a, half the stairs with that shad go fight. So it's almost a little bit of a case of coming back down and hitting those steps that you you jumped over as well. <laughs> so it's a fine balance, but we'll we'll get there. We'll get there. You know, she's got great. She's got a great team. You know, self sharpie. I think she's, you know, destined for stardom. You know, Niall uh, Barrett has so much faith in her. You know, we wouldn't have taken the Shadgo fight only for his confidence that he would have, that she would have done it. And then her dad, who's always been there as well, and you know, um, a great boxing man as well. So she's got she's got a lot of the a lot of the ingredients that you need to to get to that next level, she has them. And there's already interest from big promoters. You know, we've already had discussions with two of the biggest promoters in the UK who are interested in her and one American. So the, the only thing there is they're not going to want to develop her. Yeah. They're not going to want to get those, fill, fill those blanks of what she skipped over. They're going to want to put her straight into like a 50, 50 fight. And does she need that with only five fights and 20 years of age? Probably, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. But it's good to know that they're, uh, that they're interested. And when the time is right, and the package is complete, then we bring them to the big promoter and they're all going to be interested by that, by that stage. So I'm looking forward to seeing how our career goes. Definitely. Is. And obviously we're seeing, you know, world title fights being made. Um, Shannon Courtney and um, Ebony Bridges. Obviously, I think but one's four and and one's five and one or six and one. So yeah. it can show that how much things can change. Obviously, Caitlin's WB, WBC youth, so obviously she's a ranking yeah. the WBC yeah. and stuff there. But t- time's on her side, so she's in no rush to get to the top. And- no rush. No rush. Like, um, fair play to Shannon and uh, Ebony. You know, they're, they're, they're two girls that have marketed themselves really well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's another classic example. You market yourself well, you will get more you'll get more opportunities than a guy who's equally as good but doesn't market himself well. So the marketing, it's a you know, it's a business as well. It's not just if it's not just boxing. Yeah. It's a business as well. So if you just want to box, which a lot of guys say, I just want to box. I just want to box. I don't have to do any of that crack. I just want to box. I like, well, you should stay at Amateur. You know, because there you can just go and box and not have to worry about the business element of it. Mm-hmm. But the pro, with the pros, you also got to remember that you, it's a business, you know. Everything, all of this costs money, you know. And if you're, if you're like not prepared to talk or have any charisma or be flashy or have anything, something that you can market, you know, then you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle. But, uh, yeah. I think I think a lot of it seems to be catching on with some people. I think people see in the, the molds of Ryan Garcia, obviously done a lot for his Instagram, and, and even even the people that's coming through from, from the YouTube and things like that as well, they're getting opportunities because they invest in them themselves. Maybe it was gaming on YouTube. they done something that made them relevant that now they can yeah. earn millions of pounds. Yeah, I know that you're torn there, aren't you? I'm kind mm-hmm. of arguing against myself there. You know, it shouldn't be all about marketing. You know, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be, but it obviously is, isn't it? 
It obviously yeah. is. It obviously is. Like these guys can make more money than the vast majority of the boxers because they're bringing eyeballs from elsewhere. And uh, while I, it worries me, it genuinely worries me because uh, I don't think it looks great on boxing. You know, the guys can just waltz in and act like professional boxers. Kind of the mains, the boxers that are actually putting in grafts since the age of eight and nine, you know. And also, what if one of these gets hurt? And what if one of them gets really hurt? What if one of them gets properly hurt, like stretched out or has a life-changing injury? Like, how does that look on, on boxing then? Mm. How does that look on boxing? Like, you, we let him in. We let him in. This, we let this guy in. We let these fights happen. That worries me as well about these, you know, Roy Jones Jr., Mike Tyson type fights as well. Like, nobody's gaining from that, only, only the lads that are involved in that. You know, boxing definitely isn't gaining. I, can, I, I can't tell guys what to do, but like, it's a young man's game. And mm -hmm. whilst nutrition and health and all that has improved vastly and people's careers can, are, are obviously going on longer and longer, it just doesn't sit right with me. Uh, a lot of this YouTube, you know, stuff that's been going on, you know, because someone's going to get hurt and boxing's going to be the, the one that suffers. Yeah, but particularly when obviously for years, you know, um, that obviously so, so many people obviously done things to improve the sport of boxing. Obviously, yeah. fighters losing their lives, they obviously change rules and things like that. And, yeah. And if something like this happens then again, it's going, we obviously have lost boxers those last few years, you know, Sadly, obviously, yeah, injuries. We've lost more. We've lost more over the la over the last year in in the UK and Ireland than we've probably had in five years before that, mm -hmm. no, or ten years before that. Because uh, since um, Ben Watson, like there has been massive improvements in the healthcare provided on site at shows and prior to shows. You know, in terms of you know, medicals and stuff like that. So there is so much. You know. You know Part of the reason that it's almost impossible to make uh, money in, in small oil boxing is because of the uh, safeguards put in place by the British Boxing Board of Control and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, which I'm not going to begrudge, obviously, just, you know, to make an extra couple of pounds. You know, you know you, the, the, the safety of the box is paramount. But, like, you, you know, you need your brain scans. You need all the rest of your medical elements. You at 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 the show. You have an ambulance. You have a paramedic. You have doctors. You have a uh, specialist anaesthetist. You know you have a big team of medical support there. Even at even at a Celtic clash. Mm -hmm. So you know uh, you can't have a show more than an hour away from a special neurological center hospital. And yeah. um, you know uh, Darius fall foul at ass over the last few years um, but then again it's the golden hour you need to be able to get boxers to that hospital within that hour mm -hmm. so you can't you know it's annoying that you can't put shows on in Derry and stuff like that but it, there's a, the reason is the proximity and the health of the boxers and it's oh nothing will go wrong everyone says oh nothing will go wrong then what when it goes wrong are you going to stand up and take the blame for it? No, you're not. So the people involved there. So you caution as always. Yep. At the end of the day, you want to, you want to give the, if, if a fighter needs medical assistance, you want them to get there as quick as possible. Because yes. I, think, I think the last thing any promoter wants is to obviously be telling some of his parents that, you know, we messed up with something, yeah. I guess. And, and this is, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. you've, you've like, lost your son or you've lost your daughter and nobody wants yeah. to go through that. And, it's thankfully because of measures in the past, we don't want it to return again. Yeah, like luckily we, we've not had a serious injury on a Celtic clash, you know. But if we did, it might, think, it might stop me promoting, you know. Mm. It might do. Might do. Why don't I think about it now then? Kind of try and put it off. Just throw into the back of your head, it won't happen to us. We, you know, we do everything right. Uh, we try and make the matches as fair as possible, blah, 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 you know. But anything can happen. Anything mm. can happen. You know, anything can happen, and I uh, hope just fingers crossed it doesn't, and just do the right things. We've got great medical cover, experienced officials, um, 
referees that aren't afraid to stop a fight. You know, that's very important. Mm-hmm. Boxers, well, mostly, uh, don't know when to stop, you know. And so the officials really got to take it out of their, take it out of their hands. Mm-hmm. So having officials that are experienced and can recognize the danger signs, that's great. So we have that, you know, especially in Belfast and, and, and with the BUI, wherever we do that in Dublin or whatever. You know, you got guys that have been around a bit. They know they know other boxing. They're they're fishing officiating regularly. They're building their experience. You know, we've got some good refs in, in Belfast now as well, you know, that yeah. are you know, they've built their career from you know over the last few years and they're on they're on the big they're on our shows, they're on the big shows, they're on all all sorts and you know, it won't be. I, I don't think it'll be too long before we get an A star referee from Belfast, which is I'm not sure when the last time we had one. If if there ever has been one, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not 100 percent sure, but that would be good if we if we had a couple of A star referees. I think we've got mm-hmm. an a, a couple of A's now. I think we have a couple of A's, but not no A star. So that'd be good, you know. And that's yeah, part of their, that's part of the, you know the good officials is. It is one of the main keys to the safety of the boxers, as well as all the medical stuff, the scans, the the you know the ambulance and all that kind of stuff. That's the first line of defence is, is actually the, the the referee. Totally agree. I think um, I think one of the MTK shows um, probably don't give him credit as much as it should because he takes a mick at everybody. But Ian McGill, um, I think it was Taylor McGoldrick um, was fighting a guy first round. He had him in the ropes and. You know, everything he was teeing off on him, and nobody could notice at the time. But once you watched it back, you seen the guy was actually sleeping on his feet. And Eamon was yeah. able to quick and get in there and help. Otherwise, obviously, yeah. it could have been really bad. So, you yeah, know, hopefully, I'm hoping, obviously, if Eamon's watching, he's not going to rip the rip the mick out of me, obviously, afterwards. But you know, that that shows a highlight of obviously how good um, the referees are here. You've obviously had Hugh Russell Jr. that likes to kick towels, you know. Um, I think he's, he's obviously a famous clip on that, but. But the referees, you know, particularly yeah. obviously in Belfast, of what we've seen, have, have always been quality in what they do. Yeah, yeah, we're lucky to have good officials. Definitely do. So moving obviously on then from from Luxembourg, um, you've sort of been teasing, um, obviously before Luxembourg and things like that. Once you're coming back, that hopefully there's going to return to boxing in Ireland. Yeah, well, we've got a couple of dates booked. You know, um, we'll do a Celtic clash. Probably north of the border first. Um, we just need to clear the date with the British board first before we announce that. But that's that's it's all de- all depending on crowds getting back. And the north is ahead of the Republic on that mm-hmm. score in terms of the vaccinations. So the logical thing would be to go to the north first, yeah. And then before the end of the year, we have another show in the south, and that'll be in. Uh, in cooperation with Martin Horgan, who we did the, the Cork show with. So yeah. we're good to work with him again. So that'll be another mixed show with Mai Tai and Pro Boxing on it. And that's that's really interesting because we're 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 developing our relationship and how the two sports can work together and, and how we can market the two of them together. And he really wants to do go to the tree arena. That's where he wants to go with mm-hmm. this. Now he has some big matches, yeah. Um, for mainstream with mainstream guys mm-hmm. uh, who people know, and I'm I'm pretty sure that the matches that he has lined up will will sell half the tree arena on their own, yeah. So then the the traditional mai tai and the, and the, the traditional. Celtic Clash show effectively is, is, is would be both go in there to supplement that in the other five thousand tickets. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's I think it's about ten thousand in there. So we'll have to see how this Dublin show goes first, and uh, then decide if if we can work together. You know, we but we worked together very well on the uh, show in Cork that we did last time, mm-hmm. and. We get on well with him. He's a straight guy, you know. He's, you know, he's. What he says is what happens. 
he's, he's, uh, he's very easy to work with. You know, if you say, listen, uh, that's going to hit us here. Why don't we do this? He's all ears. You know, he's about fairness, which is another thing. That we, we're, we try to be fair. We try to be fair. Maybe we should be a bit more nasty, you know, and screwing people. But we actually try to be, just try to be, as, because I think you've got much more chance of, of longevity if you're fair. Like, mm. you can ca- throw people under the bus, cash in now, get a bit more now. But we've seen people like that, when they've come and they've gone. Yeah. You have to be much more fair. And that's the kind of, I learned that off a couple of promoters that I would not base the clash on, but take a lot of advice from. You know, Ali O. Wilton, he'll always give you a straight answer. Tell you what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing. Great boxing, man. Just spent fortunes on boxing. You know, he he probably wishes he never saw boxing. You know, sometimes I'm the same way. Mm. Like he's put so much into it, and and it's such great experience. He's a good guy to ask if you've got a problem. And you guy guys like Gary Hyde. You know, another good guy. Always there with a word of support. He knows when you might be flagging away better. If things go against you, he, he kind of gives you a way J up. It's good to get those kind of phone calls from guys that you respect. And then mm. in England, you know, like likes of Steve Goodwin, not very sexy, not very glamorous, but puts on regular shows, puts on good fights and builds fighters that haven't been picked up by the by the big promoters. Mm. Yeah. And that's probably the closest thing to Celtic Clash that we model ourselves on is mm. is is the Steve Goodwin shows because he's been in it for a long time. He's built up a stable of fighters. He puts on good shows. He doesn't uh, doesn't overextend himself. Doesn't try and be something he's not. Yeah, he knows what he is, and he knows how to get fighters to go up the ladder not all of them will get all the way up to the ladder and when he does then he works with the big guys he works with Eddie Hearn he works with Warren and he worked, used to work with a lot with David Hay mm. so that's the kind of that that's kind of model that we have as well give we're kind of a bit more democratic you know you don't have to be elitist it's not you don't have to want a senior title like what they was saying with you you don't have to ever want a senior title to make yourself a good pro yeah. and there's levels to these things like just because you won a world title yeah, or Olympic medal doesn't mean that and you're so much better than this next guy. doesn't mean he can't be a pro as well. Yeah, He's just on a different level to you. It's mm-hmm. like you don't just have the premiership. Yeah, You don't just have the Champions League. You know, there are divisions below that that people operate in. And if they're good enough, they'll climb up through the divisions. Yeah, look like, yeah. like a Jamie Verdi. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like a Jamie Verdi. So we see a Celtic clash, lads, and Celtic clash is like, hopefully like a Jamie Verdi. They start on the smaller and they work their way up through the levels and boom, in. Whereas a lot of the, a lot of the guys in the Premier, in the Premier, the Premier, Premiership, Premier League, Premier League right. pieces, they've come through their youth systems and straight into the top tier. Whereas, but there's still, there's still, a, there's still a place for the guys to work their way up the pyramid. And that's what we see the Celtic clashes as as not the top level, not the second level of boxing, yeah, but the lower tiers that facilitate guys who weren't star amateurs to work their way up and develop their skills before they go to one of the bigger promoters. That's that's what we do for. Yeah, and 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 obviously you know one of the one of the probably most successful models we've probably had of somebody, you know, is James Tennyson. You know, like. James obviously started yeah. with Martin Law, but just over eight yeah. years ago, he built himself up to the stage where people thought we'll give him a chance. He obviously, I think it is it a shock defeat on a Carl Frampton card. Went back yeah, and remodeled like himself. Yeah. Lost again, remodeled himself. He's fought for a world title. Like I, I don't know if I've ever seen of a boxer that's on, say, for instance, Twitter, that fought for yeah. a world title that's such a low fallen on social media and you're going, Yeah. If James Tennyson yeah. had to beat Tevin Farmer for that world title, yeah. he could have won yeah. anywhere in Belfast and people wouldn't know who he is. Yeah. No. Well, you, you kind of, you got to give, you got to give James a lot of credit there. Yeah. yeah. You know, he's, he's, he's gamey as fuck. 
and he's taken fights and won them at the right time, mm-hmm. you know. And you got to give Mark Dunlop a lot of credit there because he's obviously orchestrated that. Mm-hmm. You know, Mark could have walked away when he lost. Was it? It's not two legs that he lost. Something like that. I forget the name of the guy that he lost in the first the first fight that he lost that. Um, but when he lost that, a lot of guys would have walked away from him there and said, "Listen, if he's losing to a journeyman like that, God, time to time to exit." But he stuck with him and he cultivated him. And he's really looked after him. And he's been very selective in his matches. And it's worked for him. Mm-hmm. Like, we were we were ringside. There wasn't really many in the arena. When he fought Martin J. Ward. What, who was on the card was that? Uh, was, that was that Hay? Hey, was it Hay Belly 2? I think it was maybe the first one, was it? No, I think it was the second one. I think it was the second one. Because we, I think we had Carl, Carl McDonald on the undercard on, mm-hmm. on the first fight. And we went back out. We sat ringside just because we wanted the wanted the roar for him because we wanted the the officials we wanted to try and influence the officials with our with our vocal cheering. Yeah, that's yeah. basically why. You know, we went straight ringside. We were every time he landed a punch, we roared, and we were the. I was so delighted. It was probably as delighted as a lot of the team were for him. You know. Um, but that is testament to the testament to the graft that he's put in and the graft mm-hmm. that Mark's put in. Mark's done these uh, small hall shows like we have. The first Celtic Clash was a co-promotion with me and Mark and Shawnee McCullough as well, you know. Um, so he's he's put the graft in mm-hmm. over the years. So this is the fruition of that. This is exactly the Jamie Verdi thing that I'm talking about, yeah. you know. He's come right up from the small hall shows all the way up, and now he's he's got a, a contract with the with the with the most popular, biggest promoter in the world. So if we if we call him if we call him Mark Dunlop, the the magic man, what are we going to call call you? Oh, what do you think of a God. name for you? I got plenty called plenty of names. Um, I'll, I'll <laughs> stick with Leonard for now, though. Yeah. Or 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 Daddy Spike. With a, with oh, there, the mini spike, yeah. Whether well, that's that's just pure COVID boredom, you know, absolute, <laughs> absolute boredom. And when the when the lockdown goes, the the tash will come off. Um, sort of roll as I sort of do with boxers and stuff like that there as well. Rolling obviously back to the start, where did the first idea for you then come from? Obviously promoting boxing. Uh. The promotion, it's kind of something they get lured into. It's not, I didn't set out, oh, I'm going I'm to be a boxing promoter. I just wanted to support Irish boxing for starters. That was the first thing, yeah. There was a pro from our estate in Sligo called Vinnie Feeney. You might not have ever heard of him. He was a mm-hmm. pro in England back in the 90s. And I used to go and support him. And then my father's cousin is Jim Rock. He mm-hmm. was four-weight Irish pro champion. So we used to go and Go to all his, uh, go to all his fights, and our other cousin Robbie Murray also won an Irish pro title. So we used to go and follow that. We used to go and follow them, and I used to think these. They, I used to really enjoy the shows, yeah. Mm. And I wanted to, I wanted to help promote them. You know, mm. I wanted to do like I wanted to get them more attention because I'm also like yourself. I'm a League of Ireland fan. You know mm. what I mean? I'm a slagger overseas ticket holder. I enjoy actual grassroots Irish sport yeah. as much as I enjoy Champions League finals, pay-per-view boxing, all that kind of stuff I actually enjoy the, the grassroots having some kind of identifier with these guys, knowing seeing them come for, coming up yeah mm-hmm. I, that like your thing is boxing tickets NI, yeah, it's localised you've already you've already pigeonholed your, hold yourself there, it is localised, so that's you, something that you're interested in Say on me, boxing Ireland. You know, it's not gunning. It's not gunning promotions. It's boxing mm-hmm. Ireland promotions. It's that for a reason. So I started writing articles, like I don't know, over ten years ago. Anyway, yeah, 12, 13 years ago, and just doing little bits and pieces for promoters to help them with their own shows, uh, doing videos. So I started the. I, I saw Ellie Secback doing these interviews in America like mm-hmm. about 13 years ago and I thought he's terrible I thought he was absolutely terrible I thought I really want to watch interviews like this but this guy is really bad 
Mm -hmm. I could do better. I could do better than that. So actually, I, my first few. Uh, so I started a YouTube channel. So that's like twelve years ago. There was no <laughs> IFL. There was nothing in Europe. There was nothing, and uh, I used to just video some weigh-ins. Yeah, on a, a razor. Do you remember the razor flip phones? Yeah. Yeah. I used to video them on that. Honestly, the first few. If you look on on my old channel. The first few videos are like they look like they're recorded with a the potato. You know what I mean? They're honestly they're terrible. But I, I, I Bernard Dunn then was kicking off, and he really ignited the pro scene. So that I was able to get a lot more involved with going to shows and writing articles and you know doing stuff, just putting up these videos, stupid videos, Barrera, me for can and all this kind of stuff. And then I started saying, right, let's. I'm, I'm going to start interviewing these guys as well. So, because I was starting to do some articles interviewing guys for a boxing scene. Terry Dooley is the editor, was the editor of the boxing scene, and he, I used to do articles just on the Irish fellas. That's all. And uh, it was actually, you know, the reason I started doing the video interviews is because they're writing these interviews out. It's bloody hard work. Yeah. Having to transcribe all of the, everything they said then format it into an article and you know make sure the grammar is correct and all that kind of stuff that's bloody hard work i prefer to just like this is just talk nonsense for an hour i can do that no problem and um, like on that str the stream in luxembourg I, I, I was streaming that for probably about in total four hours mm. you know and just talking over it as well and all that kind of stuff so that was no problem so i said right i'm going to start interviewing these guys and i'm going to upload those videos from behind the scenes, not the type of sky stuff, more fan sort of stuff. Yeah. And uh, I was doing that. Kevin O'Hara, I remember, was one of the first ones I did. Uh, Michael Sweeney, uh, Alan Donlan, the McDonough brothers, you know, these kind of guys, they were like the first interviews that I just drew up. And uh, it's good to actually look back on it now, you know, because I don't really put, upload that much videos anymore. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I used to be uploading loads of videos. Loads of videos. All of that. I used to go everywhere. I used to go everywhere. And then, because it was Boxing Ireland, it was kind of pigeonholed into, like, just, I was never going to get any bigger. And then, the, locks, the likes of IFL came along. And I remember when um, Coogan and James started doing it. Because, you know, you'd, you'd get to know everyone at these press conferences. Mm -hmm. And then they started doing the stuff that I was doing. Yeah. But they were doing it better, and because they, because I actually had a job as well, so I'd actually do my job and then try and squeeze some of this in. So I just didn't need to do it anymore because IFL were doing it, brilliant. So they were producing that content that I wanted to see, and then I sort of stepped back and just did the odd bits and pieces that I wanted to do from then from then on. And then I started thinking about maybe managing a couple of boxers, you know. And uh, first guy in the first year, I, I think the first year I managed was 2012. The first year that I managed anyone. And I signed Joe Ray, John Hutchinson and uh, Block Rounds. So that was me off then, three guys. <clears throat> and I've just bust me balls trying to promote guys that are generally hard, hard to promote. Like Hutch. Hutch was probably the easiest to manage and promote out of them all, but he was n not always based in Donegal. He was like in England, and he was in Thailand, and he was in America, and all this kind of stuff. So he was actually a little bit hard for him to build a base. So that was, it. but he was good. Joe Ray, great boxer, absolute lunatic. He was a nightmare to manage, but great fun. Learned a lot with him. And then Block Reynolds, who's from Sligo as well, and but older than me, so that was a difficult one as well. Because it's actually very, it's actually pretty hard to manage someone that's older than you, you know, mm. and someone that has that much experience, five time amateur senior champion, and all this kind of stuff. And then, then there's this guy who has been away in England for twenty years or whatever, comes along and starts saying, oh, "I'll do this, do that." And he goes, you know. So that there was a, there were three three fires, but actually all pretty very different uh, management efforts that I had to go into it. And then I had to start getting slots for guys then. You know, that's what I had to do. And then I was all right. No one's going to keep giving you slots. So luckily, Emerald, remember Emerald 
Emerald Promotions. Do you remember yeah. them? Yeah. Vaguely remember them. And Chris, Chris Graham and uh, all the boys that used to train with the McCullers, you know, the Ginleys yeah. uh, came out of that. Uh, Jared Haley. Gorgeous um, Jared. Will, Willie Casey was actually with them for quite a long time as well. You know, those guys, Dee Walsh, Dee Walsh. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and I've seen loads of videos with them as well. They were like, you, you know, when you look back how fresh faced the boys were. So that, I got into that and then I said, right, I'm going to do it. I'm, I've got these street fighters. I'm, I can't keep, I can't keep looking for slots off guys. Yeah. Because like I always say, I say, I'll say it a million times. Everyone wants to be a manager, but nobody wants to be a promoter. Yeah. Because management is easy. Yeah. As long as you've got a promoter that'll put on as many fights as you want. Yeah. You just yeah. get them to fight. It's the promotion element. So it's the hard bit. Yeah. So I said, right, I can't just keep sponging off these people. I'm going to have to bite the bullet and do a show. So we did Celtic Clash 1 with, with Mark Dunlop. And I'm pretty sure Mark only let me to do that because he, he, it was going to be a cheap way for him to get an opponent and a title for Declan Trainer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we made that match as the headliner, Declan Trainer versus uh, Stephen Reynolds, who was 39, yeah, and just turned pro a couple of months. Two and all, and uh, trainer. I think uh, Mark had big plans for trainer, you know, um, and it was an experience. It was it was an experience. It was a real experience. I lost money on the show, didn't lose that much, but I, I lost enough for a good holiday. Let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had my eyes opened to a new appreciation for small hall promotion yeah what is required in it and pretty much Mark did the donkey share to work on that show yeah and I thought that I was doing loads but really when I look back on it actually I didn't do I remember I didn't fill in those forms I didn't go and get the insurance I didn't he did all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. as only sort of down the line later that I actually appreciated yeah, I thought I was doing all the media and I'm doing all the, getting the posters and all this kind of the soft stuff yeah, but he was actually doing all the, you know, dealing with the, the board and, you know, doing a lot of the match, making bringing opponents in from abroad, all that kind of stuff. All that kind of stuff you you think just happened, but actually someone's got to do it. It's actually bloody difficult as well. So it's a long time after that that I got the appreciation for. It. So we put on the first the first one, which was September thirteen, I think was the was the was the show, and um. I just remember like about four busloads, 52 seaters landed in the, in the Devonish car park full of Sligo, Sligo ones. And like, they were just nuts from the beginning of it. And I was just there. Like, I just hope the block wins. And that was, uh, it was a great show. There was some great fights in the undercard. Um, Paddy Gall was on it. Oshin Fagan, Dan McShane had a good fight in it. I'm not sure Tenny was on it. Uh, obviously John Hutchinson and then obviously the headliner trainer versus um, Block Reynolds and I actually showed the, 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 the professional videographer that version of it is on YouTube now yeah mm-hmm. it, it, was, it was only put up like a couple of years ago and I remember what I remember I actually showed it to my young fella there about a year ago not even a year ago a few months ago during the lockdown I said there watch this and he he was off his seat watching it. You know, this is a small hall fight against two guys who between them only have three fights in total. Fighting for a Celtic Nations title, which I cre- which I created mm-hmm. the year before. Um, and it was an unbelievable fight. It was an absolute... Have you watched it? Have you ever watched it? I don't think I have watched, watched it. it. Been to- oh. As I say, totally honest, I always am. I don't think I have watched it. You should do. It's a bloody brilliant fight. It's a bloody brilliant fight. The atmosphere in the place was absolutely electric. It was absolutely electric. Uh, it's probably it's probably the fa- the most the, it's it's my favorite fight of any fight that I've been in, involved in. Yeah, it was an absolute it was an absolute cracker. It went one way, then the other, and then back the other way, and we got the we got the win. We got the knockout, and then Block Friends retired. Then after that, so sweet. Yeah. 
That was my all, first. Always one up in Mark ever since. Uh, I wouldn't go that far. I wouldn't <laughs> go that far. He's he's definitely got one up on me over the last year. But um, uh, you know, he does a good job, doesn't he? You can't knock yeah. that. Yeah, he does. So you've, I think, I think I'd sort of said sort of off there before we started. I think you've done twelve shows now. You promoted twelve shows. Right, yeah. So we've been a promoter on twelve, and then we've kind of been involved significantly on probably another four others. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, there's been ten Celtic actual Celtic clashes. You know, see, mo mo majority of these are co promotions. You know, mm -hmm. I like doing co promotions because it takes a lot of pressure. First of all, it takes a lot of pressure off you. Yeah, and I like working with other people. To, I like to learn things off them. Do you know what I mean? And it dissipates the risk. So, uh, if something's going to go tits up, you're only going to go half tits up, you know, from a selfish financial perspective. And that's the way it should be. You should be able to work with people, you know. Uh, some people just want the whole, the, 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 the limelight or the, it's, it's uh, honestly, it's, it's like two bald men fighting over a comb. Yeah, it's not worth anything. It's no, no good to you. It, it means nothing. You're better off getting a load of people that you trust. Like, look at, look at even Box in Ireland. Stephen Sharp, myself and Dennis, you know, we're very close, very close. Uh, we discuss everything. We discuss everything together. I can't remember us ever falling out about anything. Like, it works so well. You know, and it's very hard, especially when it's not making, like, if it was making bundles of money, it'd be very easy. But, like, there's a reason that nobody wants to put on shows. Yeah, there's a reason nobody wants to put on shows. Because it doesn't make money. And it takes, it's hard. Well, we're still in a building stage with um, Box in Ireland. Yeah. And it's very hard, very hard to stick at it. And they're like, so you're doing show after show after show. And then you're not, you're not, there's, no, there's nothing, there's no financial gain at the end of it. And I just think maybe I should just stick at my own career. I would have, I've actually given up a lot by focusing on boxing so much and doing all. If I did not, well, what I said, if I, if I'd never done anything with boxing, where would I be with my own career? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't like to have that discussion with the missus because, you know, she's, she's, you know, she's right. It's, it's actually, it's been, it's, 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 uh, it's tough. It's pretty tough to do these things. You know, and like I said, they all want to be managers. They don't want to be promoters. Like I wish, I wish if someone if someone wants to be a promoter, wait, I would be. I back them hundred percent, and I'd support them, and I'd help them for nothing. I always say it. Put on one show, and then come back and tell me. You know, well, how how your experience was? I'd help you. But I would love if there was someone putting on a show all the time, and I could just put the guys that I manage on that show. Sweet. The hard bit is the promote is the shows. That that's the stuff that'll age you. The management's the fun bit. You know, you're getting, you're trying to get like uh, marketing. You're doing posters. You're doing, you know, it's good stuff. Yeah. The bloody promotion element of it is so stressful. You know, it's really, really stressful. It takes it really takes it out of you. You don't, you really don't want to hear anything about boxing after it. And you're just, you're just relieved when everyone's gone home. Yeah, everyone's got home safely. Sweet, you switch off. You're just like so sick of it. Um, yeah, don't know why. Sometimes we don't know why you do it, but some, something's keeping me doing it. It's like, like obviously myself and yourself sort of had like a well, probably a, like a minor disagreement. Obviously last year, you know, like the outsider looking in. Obviously, even the yeah. the myself sometime, and obviously on what we do, you always have the opinion of going. You don't see a promoter. That obviously hasn't making money in the sport, but I cast my mind back, and probably a lot of it's changed from an Irish boxing, Irishboxing.com article last May. Obviously, looking into the the costs and stuff of running shows, and obviously for anybody, it's sort of you know it's probably good for Joe and Johnny that I'm sort of plugging this for them in a way. But if somebody has any doubts as to how much it put, and stuff it put, costs to put on shows, look at that yeah. article and then see what your opinions like on it because nothing's cheap. No, and especially not putting shows on in the Republic of Ireland. Mm -hmm. That is something that is not cheap. Yeah, that is prohibitively expensive. All to 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 the point that it's almost impossible. 
you know, like we have a lot of fighters who can all sell tickets to a degree, but and we can't afford to put shows on. Like it's something wrong there, you know. And we're not making, we're not even looking. To, we're looking to break even. Mm. So it's like it's a, it, it's yeah, it's easy to say. Because uh, I know I I did have a little bit of a reaction to your. I remember that comment you made. Mm. Yeah, you said like you don't see any you don't see any poor promoters. And they're like, wait a minute. Yes, you bloody do. Mm. Look at the list of promoters in Irish boxing that have all gone bump or sacked it off or just refused to do it anymore because they've lost so much money doing it and they get no, so they're not getting any money, they get no gratitude and it's it's a massively stressful operation and it's so precarious because look at Frampton's show, the, the McGuigan show, the last one with, with Frampton where your man bust his face. Yeah. So you put on this show You've hired out the Odyssey. You've spent a fortune getting everybody in. They've all weighed in. So now they're probably going to get paid. Mm-hmm. And then he goes and busts his face the night before the show. Honestly, I, I went white when I, when, I, when, I, when I heard that. I went white thinking about that could be us. You know, like that is, talk about exposure to risk. Like that is massive exposure. Like, Spent all this money flying these people from all over the place, hotels, food money, uh, transport, <laughs> the venue hire, all the officials. Everything's paid for. After the weigh in, everything's paid for. You know, you're not going to get any money back. And then he goes, busts his face, and then your show's cancelled. So that's all your revenue gone. So it's like, oh man, that, and, like, and that's even before you go online and, and you see all the comments of, uh, the McGuigan's hired guys from Sandy Road to do him in because they thought Carl was going to get beat because he missed weight. You know, that was, that's not even taking the comments into it and, and sort of what happened. Yeah. So to be a well, promoter sometimes, you can't be on social media. Yeah. Well, like, I I, I also thought there must there might have been uh, some underhand activity going on there. You don't know. It's a weird yeah. thing. But how did he bust his face like that? Did someone bust him in? You don't know. But there was loads of conspiracy theories going around there. But I, I don't know. I, well, I don't know. I wasn't there. Do you know what I mean? When he got busted. But all I know is I, I can't imagine that. The, m- m- why would the McGuigans do that? They're going to lose. A, they're going to lose a big lump of money when the show being pulled off after they've they've already gone to the expense of putting on the show. Mm. There's very little. There's very little. Would have they would have been able to claw back from the show not going on. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I remember sort of having the opinion sort of straight after that and stuff as well and going, well, the main event can't happen. Let the rest of the fighters fight. Because, yeah. you know, as you said, they're still going to get paid. It yeah. would probably, if you were given, given say, only 2,000 of the fans back their money, but you had other fans that went to the, you know, a lot of them, the rest of them went because they had hotels booked or whatever. You know, yeah. I was of that opinion going, let the rest of them fight. You know, but yeah. then if they lost the TV sponsorship and things like that, you yeah. know, it's whenever you get into that spiral in boxing, you go, ah, no, the, the TV must do that for free, you know, you must do this, it's, you know, they owe them a favour, but there's a lot more cost yeah, Listen, you don't, you don't know the individual deals of what, you know, what they, what they had to pay for, what they were able to claw back, you know, what the board would want, you know, you, you don't know, maybe you, you think, well, could you, could you swap that to a different venue, smaller venue, like overnight, you don't know. Mm-hmm. It just obviously didn't work, you know. And then the, everything was hinged on the Frampton fight, so the rest of it is pretty much a bit of a sideshow, mm-hmm. you know. Um, would, would only two thousand want there? Probably not. Probably only two thousand would go mm-hmm. without Frampton being there, you know. So it's all it was all dependent. It was all dependent probably on that Frampton fight. But what the the point is, it's bloody. It's a it's a precarious activity. And that's why nobody really wants to do it. And it, what I always say to people is, how many accountants do you know? Loads, because they make loads of money. How many can- mechanics do you know? There's loads of mechanics around. You know, every profession, uh, there's loads of people doing it because it makes money. How many boxing promoters do you know? How many, how many is there? How many is there in Ireland? Well, there's, there's probably what? There's, there's you, there's Connor, and there's Mark. There you go. There you go. Like if it was making money, there'd be a lot more people doing it. So I'm not I'm not trying to I'm not trying to whinge about all, but I, what I'm trying to say about it is it's it's bloody not it's not easy 
it can be fun. It can, it's, uh, I've met a lot of good people. Uh, I've met a lot of ungrateful people. Um, but it uh, hardens you, bloody hardens you as well. You kind of get cold about these things. Like, uh, sometimes I wish I could just sit at ringside and enjoy fights. But, the, you know, when you're doing a, the promotion, you, it's very difficult to actually even watch the fights because you got other spinning loads of plates and you need to keep, keep them going. But uh, we must get something out of it. I have had, I've, I've had this discussion with Steve. Why are we doing it? Why, why are we doing it? Especially after, like, we have a bad show, financially a bad show. Like, Celtic last year, I forget what it was, seven or something like that. It was an absolute disaster financially. Cost us a fortune. It was a brilliant show. Everyone loved it. The one with, that they had uh, Aslan on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Aslan was singing on it. And the fights were great. Everyone was like clapping their back on the way out and saying, I was the best show they've been to in ages, blah, blah, blah. One of, the good, one of these good council ones. Banging. And then you're sitting down with Tony Dunlop at the end of the night and you're like, Where's the where's the door? You know, we're 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 we've lost a lot of money on this. You know, we put on a great show, we've marketed it, we put on good fights, we've marketed it heavily. We've put, it's been brilliant, everything's been perfect, and you've just lost your ass. There's not a queue of people lining up for that experience, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. yeah, obviously thinking thinking obviously, you know, boxing does return. Do you think the pandemic would have made things worse for boxing or do you think it may have been better? And obviously thinking more in terms of sponsorship for boxers, sponsorship obviously, because obviously what you do need sponsorship as well because it's really the only guaranteed income you have because you can't guarantee yeah. every ticket's going to sell. What way do you think, do you think a pandemic, do you think is going to change much of that for boxing? I'd love to give you an answer to that. I, I, I haven't a clue. I haven't a clue. Like you, you it could go... It could it could go one of three ways. It could it could make improve it and have loads of loads more competitive fights domestically and just everyone starts fighting each other. Yeah. Could go that way. It could go really backwards. Like people are gonna almost effectively have to start rebuilding their career from start fighting journeymen again mm -hmm. and not gonna fight and and you're further away from those fights. Or it could go the other way, where it just goes back to exactly the way it was, you know, uh, 15, 16 months ago, you know. Um, I don't know. Just have to play it by ear. Just have to play it by ear. Like we've seen, we, we will definitely see fighters fall away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of, a lot of them will uh, have got, had to get jobs and realise, actually, uh, uh, it's nice having a bit of money, isn't it? And not having to rely on a couple of fights every year where you're busting your ass A in the gym, B to sell tickets, C to market yourself. It's bloody difficult. It's not, and not, no one's underestimating the effort that these guys have to uh, um, undertake to make a successful career. It's bloody hard work on all fronts. And so much of it is put onto the boxer until they get up the ladder and they start getting the sponsorship that will pay for all this or the deals that pay then it starts getting easier mm -hmm. but the first five steps on this on the, on the ladder are really difficult so a lot of those guys have probably gone gone from boxing you, know, you won't get them back but then there's other guys that will want to come into it but it'll, it'll, I think it'll take a while it'll take a while to get back to where it was because it was really just starting to really starting to crank up really starting to go like we, we planned some really nice really nice fights and then they might not happen now you know because some of them might have retired or whatever but um i think there'll be a, a a period of rebuilding but then i also think you know eddie hearn's uh fight camp stuff that was brilliant mm -hmm. you know and that was on the pandemic i'd love to see that happen and more that type of fight camp where guys that aren't uh just the, the matchroom guys getting to look in on these shows. You know, it was people that are wanting to fight, they got to look in. And what, what, they're ready and willing and able to fight. They got the nod. You know, for a lot of reasons, other guys wouldn't have taken fights on it because, you know, they might have been too early in their career or they weren't 100% fit or they need more experience. Fair enough. 
but guys that were willing, ready and able, boom. The, the phone calls were coming in. Lots of guys turned down really good fights that we had, but they were, for one reason or another, it wasn't great for them. But the, I'd like to see the fight camp thing happen, and again, that'd be great. I think that's been probably the, the, the massive thing that I took out of it all. You know, when have you ever seen the, the likes of it? Obviously, do you could ever have the opportunity to have a, a fight camp in your back garden? And I know Eddie's plans to do it again this year because it's so successful, and I think he's sort of going to turn it into a pay me so much to come into my garden to watch the fights. And loads of people will do that because of because of what Eddie's created, you know, in matchroom. Yeah. And a lot of that's probably down to the work he's done since his father. You know, because oh, so, he's, so he's talking about he's talking about selling tickets on that one. This next talking time, about selling tickets and, and having it because yeah. I think they're the big massive big massive place in the back. So I think they're gonna No, no I I've I've been there. I've been I've actually been to a barbecue there. I remember mm. it was the, I forget what there was a barbecue for. I remember Cal Brook arriving in a helicopter. And uh, it was pretty, it's pretty impressive to be honest with you. But uh, it, it's not that big. It's not that big. It's not that big. I, like you probably could only have maybe maximum five hundred seats. I would have thought. But obviously, he's going to pay. You're going to pay a fair whack, and yeah, you're going to have probably probably a marquee with some food and then drinks, and then you sit down. Probably going to be a really high level, like like kind of some of the German shows that they have. You know, the Klitschko ones used to have, you know, where people, mm-hmm. everyone comes in suits, you know, pretty much every, every, the women are sort of in their cocktail dresses, you know, and something like that. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Look it'd great. Be, it'd pretty much be like a VIP of obviously some of the big shows. Yeah, like a would, VIP, like a yeah. VIP. They'll get, yeah, get food probably right. served to them and, and everything else, but sure, why not? Yeah. You know, in a day, it's going to yeah, keep, yeah, keep boxers yeah. earning as yeah. well, you know. Yeah. Um, obviously... But with the pandemic and everything else, is it probably show more further evidence? And obviously, Ireland as a whole is so far behind the rest of the, the UK when it comes to boxing. Yeah, well, it's only in England that the the British board are only allowing fights in England at the moment. They're not allowed any in Wales, Scotland, or Northern Ireland. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the BUI aren't allowing anyone in the Republic either. But even if it, when it gets back up, it's it's purely about concentrations of populace. Yeah. There's no like if you, you, people think oh, Dublin's big city, uh, Manchester's about the same size as it. So why isn't there the same sort of levels of fights going on too? Well, the, Manchester might be the same size as Dublin, but within an hour's drive of Manchester is ten million people. You know, you got Liverpool, Bolton, uh, Leeds, Stockport, Burnley. You know, all, all these places within an hour's drive mm-hmm. of Manchester. So you're dealing with massive populaces there. You know, you got a ma- you got massive catchment areas. Whereas you don't have that in Ireland. And mm-hmm. also you don't have you don't have the big population. So you don't have you don't have journeymen. That is a that's a big inhibitor to regular more regular shows in Ireland. A lack of journeymen. Um every every opponent's got to be flown in with their coach it's, it's, it's a big additional expense uh, and uh, I think that's probably you're never going to be able to overcome that we're on an island off an island yeah off Europe mm-hmm. yeah we're it's a pretty rough it's a you know I know the world's getting smaller with the internet and flights and all that kind of stuff yeah but we're actually it, it reality is we're a relatively re- remote location you know, we're an island off an island off a continent. It's it's remote. It's like the, the show in Luxembourg. Most of the opponents on that show drove to that, drove to that uh, venue, jumped in a car from whatever country they're from and drove to the venue. Mm. You can't do that in Ireland. Yeah. You know, you can't do it in Ireland. You, you, everything has to be, the amount of planning needs to go in. Because you need flights for them, you need flights for them. Well, where's their hotels? Who's going to pick them up from the airport? How are they going to get from the the way in back to their hotel? How are they going to, you know, all the logistics of all of that is just adds a cost and b lots more work, so it makes it a lot more harder. So that means if it's a lot more harder, it's, it's going to happen less. So the easier it is, the more it's going to happen. So it's difficult and it's more expensive. So so you're never we're never going to be able to run, or, no, pandemic or no pandemic. We're never going to have shows as regular as the UK 
because of the populace there and how easy it is to put shows on. So we're always going to be at, at a massive dis- disadvantage until the DUP build that bridge to Scotland, you know. Mm-hmm. Which, yeah, Never happened. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, <laughs> so we're always going to be behind it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. The, I guess I would say the other big thing as well is we don't have the luxury of, of TV companies getting involved in boxing. Yeah, now that is disappointing. Like, I'm mm-hmm. surprised, like, um, well, England doesn't have that luxury really either, terrestrial-wise. You know, BBC, boxing's a dirty word there, has been yep. since Audie Harrison fiasco. Uh, ITV, I grew up on ITV fights, fight night, you know, fight the the big fight live on ITV was unbelievable. The best, best shows. Like, there, I, I can't remember the last time I saw um, boxing on ITV. Was it Mick Hennessy? The Mick Hennessy, was he the last one that had a contract? I think there? it was, That's yeah. Years ago. Like, that is a long time ago. And obviously, Channel 5 shows some boxing with Mick Hennessy. And they've got a show coming up in May. So that's great. Yeah. So, okay. So there's one out of five terrestrial channels in England showing boxing. Now, of course, the two big sports channels do. And that's where the main promoters are. Mm-hmm. Again, we're, we're that, we're, you come down to it being a, a population thing, you know. Uh, we, just, we just ain't got the clout. We punch above our weight. But then... That needs to be followed by the financial uh, crowds. You know, we're great. We are great at the odd time coming together, but it doesn't happen regular enough. So we're always going to struggle. And it's like, I know, what, you know I'm not taking a gripe at BBC Sport NI, but, but obviously they, they've obviously done um, shows in Elster Hall. They've obviously shown on the, button, on the red button. You think with the pandemic and, and watching, you know, you only have to go. Obviously, that show in Luxembourg last week should have, you know, if they didn't have the problems with with internet and things like that, it would have been a pay per view show. BBC, RTE, they all can see the model that's been created and and how they could potentially have a pay per view stream, but they just yeah. don't want to do it. You know, it's as if no. as I say, they want to be a manager and not a promoter. You know, it's that yeah. sort of landscape again, and going. I don't want to get my hands dirty and help. But I'll go and I'll go and cover it and do interviews. Yeah, well, you got you, you also got to re- re- remember that the reputation of boxing has taken a significant kicking in in, in the mainstream media in in, in Ireland, especially mm-hmm. over the last few years, and it's difficult for for them to sell it to their commercial partners. You know, mm-hmm. especially not BBC because they don't have ads, but like RTE and stuff like that. It was already pretty, bloody pretty difficult. You know, and now you're really pissing into the wind with them. You know, like there are, I agree with you. There, there, there are ways, a few different ways to skin a cat, and that red button stuff, I think, is the way forward. You know, with like the likes of BBC, which going on to the iPlayer. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I've seen some MMA shows from the Oscar Hall on the iPlayer, so that kind of thing that could work. I think yeah. that could, and that is the kind of stuff that we are talking about and looking at. So keep your eyes open for that one. But I think you've hit the nail on the head there. I think that's could be the way in mm-hmm. or the future or both. It's only going to help more, you know, if, they, if that's amateur shows they're going to watch, then they have to have to give them a car up to go, well, here are the show we're doing next week's a professional show. You could be on that one day. It gives people more yeah. of an opportunity to achieve something in life. You know, and that's what yeah. I guess. What that's what this country's been all about. People obviously live in the, the land of hope. You know, obviously of something better. Because let's face it, the, Ireland as a whole is third rate, probably to some other countries in the world, and, and what they've had luxuries to. So yeah. give everybody a bit of hope, hope and going. One day I want to be in BBC Sport NI as a pro boxer on the Ulster Hall or the Devon this year. Yeah, if you if you if you can get if you can. If you can get it on to the iPlayer, right, BBC iPlayer, which is a massive platform and growing because most people are watching stuff on their phone now, yeah? Mm. If you can get that on there and you can start proving numbers, yeah, then you're obviously in a much better position to be able to go on to the terrestrial TV. Mm. So again, it's it's about build. It's going to take a long time. It's about building. It's about proving your the quality. It's about 
improving the quality of the cards, improving the production, improving the venues. But that all takes time. It all takes time. And I ain't going to, I can't put my hand in my pocket and throw 200 grand at a show. You know, just can't. I'd love to do that. But my missus would, would leave with the kids the following day, you know. Yep. So I'm not going to do that, you know. Um, so so what, you really, what you need to do is build it organically. And that's going to take time. And we have plans to do that. We have been in discussions with people. Like we were hopeful that the TG4, TG Carter, uh thing would, would develop because we put on a really good show over it. Derek Donovan versus Stephen McAfee. Mm. But then they said they were interested, but then they sort of, they went away and said, oh, the, the budgets are gone. The budgets have been slashed and all that kind of stuff. What can you do? Just keep, keep banging away. Definitely. Is. And obviously, as I said, I'm having my, my sort of great part here. Um, the Amateur Irish Box Association um, have obviously been awarded 46 grand between seven amateur clubs. Um, I'm using this as, as the same examples I used in Dee's interview yesterday. Um, so fun and sport like golf have been awarded 4.1 million. Yeah. Does that sort of nail it all in the head about how much, I guess, sometimes people think of boxing that, you know, 47 grand, seven grand, for yeah. instance, between... I don't, I don't, I actually don't think it's a slap in the face about, I actually think it's, it, it highlights the poor organisation within boxing. Yeah, because... I will. I listened. I told you earlier. I listened to the Stephen Nolan program on that. Mm. Now he's a bit of a melter at the best of times, but he actually there was loads of good points brought up in it. The golf and associations sent the forms out to all the clubs, told them how to fill them in, how to apply for this grant, all that kind of stuff. They warmed them up. They did all the work for them. The GEA did the same. I think GEA got more than, no, no, no I think yeah, it got seven million. Six and and a half, got I four think million. Got. Well, there you go. I know that was split between, split between a couple of hundred clubs, like, but, mm. you know, if every club had been as organized, uh, fair enough, the GEA is a, is a, is a massive organization and they've got loads of people that can help on this. But surely the heads up to all the local clubs, sh- they should have been told about, about, these grants so mm-hmm. that they could apply they can't, you can't apply for a grant you don't know exists yeah. and it's the government it's, it's government body's uh, job to keep these people aware of this kind of stuff so it's actually it's actually poor organisation that, that stopped them I don't think it was like people are trying to funnel money off to the golf I think it was more of a case the golf got their act together better than anyone else and mm-hmm. got all the forms in, and got everything, all the all the T's crossed, and the I's dotted, and there were all, everyone was briefed properly of how to fill it out and what to say, and all that. And they got all the money. Organization, that's that's what it is. Yeah, disappointed because no, but... you'd like to see the box because the boxing gloves obviously deserve a lot more than golf clubs because mm-hmm. they give a lot more into society. Now, the golf clubs might bring a lot more revenue in terms of tourists and stuff like that, but in terms of social ills keeping lads off the street, keeping, you know, hard to reach people, uh, hope and discipline and respect and stuff like that, that boxing deserve, you know, unlimited dough, you know. Mm. So it's disappointing that they couldn't get their act together and get it. Totally agree. And hopefully some, some good may come out of it. Hopefully in the back end, they realise that a lot of amateur clubs need the investment they hope, as I say, with mental health, yeah. they're giving people something they live for and, and things like that. Because boxing's shown over the years, it keeps people out of jail, keeps them going down the wrong path. Yes. And yeah. puts, something, puts something back into people's lives. And, yeah. Say, yeah. Um, you know, that's the, the most important like thing. Not, like not, a, not everyone that goes into a box club is going to come out a champion, but they, they might come out with skills that will help them in other parts of their lives. You know, and, re- and again, it's like I say, it's hard to reach kids. It's hard to reach kids, you know, that like other stuff, programs in school doesn't, doesn't, they don't take any notice. But a box, people in a box club, they might do, you know. So it's those kids that are very hard to reach that boxing really helps the most. Definitely is. And, and I sort of uh, want to leave you on obviously one final thing. Um, obviously, someday, whenever you're first starting out, um, and obviously what you're doing and obviously your YouTube interviews and stuff like that, but Carl Frontman probably one of the ones you would have interviewed and stuff at the start. Nine yeah. days away, I think by the time this interview comes out, it'll be eight days away um, from hopefully creating Irish history against Jim O'Hearn. Um, 
obviously I want to ask you first of all on your on your thoughts on courage chances. Uh, it's a tough one, isn't it? It's a tough one because is this a peak Cara Frampton anymore? I don't know. He, he like some of his most recent performances has not been spectacular, mm. you know. Uh, but this could be the fight that reignites all that passion for him. You know, it's a big accolade, the first boxer from anywhere in Ireland to win a, a world championship, first male to win a, a championship at three weights. Unbelievable uh, achievement. And hurrying it, it whilst he's a, he's a monster at the weight, looks massive. In those face to face early promo shots with Carl, he looked, you're just thinking, well, what the heck? What's going on here? Like, are, they can't be in the same way, surely. He's not amazing. He's good. But he's not amazing. He's definitely beatable. You know, this is probably Carl's best chance to make that historic leap. So I, I really hope, I really hope he does it. I really hope he does it because he's done an amazing amount for a revival or even a continuation of mm. big support for boxing in Ireland when it was kind of a, you know, we were kind of in between things. So that, that happens a lot, you know, you, you know, you had Rogie and then you have um, McCluskey. And then we needed the Frampton. You know, we, we've got Conlon coming through, but Frampton was the, the main man that bridged those two eras, you know, from mm. McCluskey to, if we didn't have Frampton, from McCluskey to Conlon's a long time. So Frampton, probably the biggest of them all as well in terms of in terms of numbers that he does, you know, and in terms of uh, reach into the casual fan, mm -hmm. he's he's been unbelievable. It's been unbelievable. I I didn't think he'd be as big as he was. I always thought he was a really good personality from from when I first met him. Or when he used to be on boxing forums back in the day, he was you could always tell he's got a good he's got a good personality, got a what I call a high likability factor, mm -hmm. you know. And that that'll that'll do him well. And he's, he had a big punch. And then he had all the backing from Barry. Barry pushing him into you know, everywhere and Barry opening doors for him. It was a great combination between the two of them. Really uh, I don't like it the way it's panned out, you know, it's mm -hmm. sad. It's really sad the way it's panned out. It's not nice, not nice. Um, and I think the two of them, they'll probably never, they'll probably never reconcile. Yeah, and I think the two of them will probably regret it. But neither of them will ever. It's it's broke. When an egg's broke, it's broke. You know, you can't put the egg back together again. You know, you had something that was, and then it's broke. It's done. It's never come back. So that's sad. You that's never know. Sad. I guess but sometimes you say times a healer. So obviously, when Carl's retired and. You know, sometimes something burns on the inside. You just have to fix sometimes, and maybe they might. You know, yeah. who knows? They'll, they'll maybe speak in passing, but probably not be as close as everywhere. Yeah. Well, like they, did uh, did Eastwood and McGuigan ever make up? I don't think they did. Did they? No, I don't think they did either. No, and they did amazing things together as well. So it is sad, isn't it? It's just it it, it happens in boxing as well because it's, it's just bloody crazy, stupid sport. You know, whereas. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's an edgy sport, you know, full of big characters, and sometimes, sometimes these things happen. You know, at all levels, I've had it, I've had it myself to a small degree. You know, um, so I, I really, I really, I'm really sad that actually that's happened with, between Carol and and thing. You know, I wish it didn't because they were, it was such a good. Such a good fit in the early days, and the, you know, the rise of it, you know, and uh, I think it probably reflects bad on boxing as well. It's the old cliche, oh, the manager Robin, the the young naive boxer kind of tale, just reinforces that stereotype. So it's probably not, probably wasn't good for boxing. But anyway, listen, I hope Carl goes ahead and he he, he wins as well. Um, he's got all the attributes. And uh, the attitude to to go and do it. So fingers crossed he can. And it, it's I guess it sets the precedent for somebody to then go and beat him then, and somebody to become a four weight world champion. So he's setting a new a new benchmark for people to follow. And yeah, you know, and, and that's what we want. We want somebody be to become a bet. three weight. You know, you've Katie as a two weight. You've yeah. um, Collins. The yeah, two weight. You've only yeah. ever three three weight world champions 
in the UK or Ireland, and they're all from from England and Scotland and things like that. Yeah. So Rusty have one now as well. You know, it, yeah. it bodes us better, and people going, "Here, do you remember Carl Frampton?" You know. Um, oh, I don't think I don't think everyone, anyone will need be need to be prompted about Carl Frampton. You know, his his career and his popularity um, is on pretty unparalleled. You know, I can't remember. You know, McCluskey had a bit of, had a bit of it for a short period of time. Rogie had a bit of it for a short period of time. Mick Connell looks like he could be he could eclipse it coming, but you don't know that. That's to be determined. Um, I can't think of anyone as McCullough. I don't think was as popular as Carl. So you're gonna you're really gonna have to go back in time to find someone as popular on Carl as popular as Carl. Especially in Belfast, you know, mm. I can't, I can't think of, I can't think of anyone that probably had the draw that he had, you know, probably back to McGuigan, you know, McGuigan was banging out the Kings Hall, you know, when was that early eighties? Mm -hmm. So you know, that's a long, it's a long time ago. So you know, he's 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 repopularized big big night professional boxing in Belfast, you know, and they've had some amazing events. You know the Windsor Park one uh, that he most recently had, and then the Titanic Shipyard thing that he did with the McGuigans, and then the Odyssey nights that they had with Keiko and stuff like that when he was when Hearn was promoting, and then all the way down to like the Ulster Hall shows that McGuigan started off on with Satanta Sports. Mm -hmm. They were great nights as well, you know. So he's had some career. He's so had many some memories. Career. Is is it probably you know not that we're we're slating obviously you know the promotion and things like that in the show, but for 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 Carl to make Irish boxing history, and he's not even going to be on a, a UK broadcaster. Is it sort of I know Carl will probably not be thinking of that right now, but in uh, terms I, I of think, yeah, I don't I like. He, I hope he isn't thinking about it. I, I'm sure he'd be disappointed. I'm sure he'd be disappointed, but hopefully something gets sorted. What well, like. It's getting late, isn't it? For something mm -hmm. to get sorted, it's like it's bloody late. I hope uh, it deserves to be on. It deserves to be on terrestrial TV. Never mind, like a premium sports channel or wherever it's going to end. If it's got ends up on YouTube, that would be. Oh God, that's how I don't know how that's happened. But anyway, it's not. At least everyone, uh, everyone will get to see it. It'll probably do massive numbers. Mm -hmm. It was like this. It was like it was like Luxembourg, where the promoter stream went down. There was probably going to be probably I don't know, five hundred people would have bought that pay per view, right? I don't, I actually don't know I, because I've never done one. Yeah. But we streamed it on the Boxing Ireland page, and in total, we've probably got about fifty thousand views. Mm. You know, between the three videos or the four videos, probably for over fifty thousand views. So, like, you know, multiple times the the eyeballs on it because it was on a free platform so maybe maybe that'll be the case if it's on ITV it'll actually the reach will be significantly higher than if it was on a, a you know like a BT sport or something like that which not everyone not everyone has but everyone's got access to pretty much everyone at the internet's got access to YouTube and with the ability with the I've watched some of those cards that I, and I cast them onto my TV from my phone mm -hmm. and the quality is exactly Quality is brilliant. The quality is mm -hmm. I've got a relatively big TV, and quality is brilliant on it. You know, it doesn't pixelate, um, and I'm sure that you know there'd be no expense spared on the production or that. So uh, you know, listen, it could be a good thing because it'll mean to be more eyeballs. It's just weird. It's just weird. That's all. That's all. But particularly what positive. we're used to in boxing, you know, we're used to obviously all big time boxing's obviously on on TV. Obviously, we might look back on this in a, in a week or so's time yeah. and go. Here yeah, we wrong. What, like, like, look at the zone, the zone taking over. That's an app, and then uh, the is tri Trilla that won that big purse bid. That's an app as well. I, I mm. don't really know much about that. Like, but like, there's new ways of uh, of consuming the content, and maybe this is just the start of the start of a new way because IFL is by far the biggest boxing interview channel now, isn't it? I don't yeah, know. I think it's I think it's nearly seven hundred thousand subscribers. Right, okay. Um, I actually remember when my channel used to have more subscribers than it. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 
you know, they've done an unbelievable, like it's mm -hmm. been an unbelievable success, you know, like anytime he does an interview with Eddie Hearn, you're pretty much guaranteed a million views on it. Yeah. Like, on, it's unbelievable, you know, it's unbelievable. They've done, like, they've done amazing. It's been an amazing, it's been an amazing thing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe the, the, that's the future. That's how people are going to consume their, their, uh, their, their boxing through these very pay-per-view platforms and you, you spend a small amount uh, like on a Facebook stream or a, a website or an app or whatever or the zone or something like that you get it through there but if this is free on IT on IFL uh, I would say it'll probably get it'll, it'll have bigger numbers than if it was on Sky Sports or, or BT Sport mm -hmm. so I don't think that'll I'll be annoyed about that but it just kind of loses a little bit of prestige I suppose by not being on it because people look to oh if it's on BBC it must be good you know what I mean if it's on RTE mm -hmm. oh, forget about RTE like, but you know if it's on you know if it's on one of the premium channels it must be better than something that's not on a premium channel yeah. just because of the prestige of that outlet you know so people are not used to having big fights on IFL TV but like I say the numbers might it might might be um, there might be a method to the madness, and definitely show us that probably technology taking over our mindsets. Yeah, yeah. Well, look here we are on a Zoom. You like you wouldn't have done this last year. No. So it's you know, and it just shows you how fast things change. You know, you know, all this working from home, everything's gone. The techno, the amount of technology the people have got had have got more of fear with over the over the pandemic. You know. People are streaming raves on uh, a pay per view off websites, and you know, people are consuming their entertainment in different ways. Mm -hmm. And as the technology gets better, then that's only going to increase. Definitely, as everything improves over time. But look, obviously, I think we'll leave it leave it for there. I think I think we spoke for about an hour before we started as well. So I think yeah. I think it's probably about. Three hours, fifteen minutes. I'm not sure how much has been recorded. No way, but don't say that. I, I think uh, I think D's short term record of obviously been the longest video is is gone and gone and dusted in the same week. Yeah, well, I can talk for uh, I can talk for Ireland and you can talk for Northern <laughs> Ireland. So combined, you know. I think I'm going to have to start putting a disclaimer out to boxers and saying, look, don't be panicking if you're if if obviously I'm asking you to do an interview, I'm not going to keep you on all night. But no. but I guess they say it's good to talk and. You know, it, it shows sometimes that the passion obviously you have if you can speak about a sport for so long, it shows how much you love it. Yes. Oh, I could talk about it all night. You know what I mean? I could talk about it all night. And listen, just I just hope that we get it uh back on the island of Ireland as soon as possible and get the shows going. And I have been saying to people I won't be taking a uh seven seven fight card at the Devonish uh, for granted anymore, you know, because I would I would give me uh give me right arm for uh, to to put on have a good good night out and a good show there now at the moment, you know. So definitely would. I can't wait for boxing return. I think a wee a pint from the from the last Devonish card. Um so yeah. obviously looking forward to Adam guess will be good and hopefully it won't be too long do we have it. Fingers crossed. Definitely. Well listen then it's been a it's been a pleasure getting catch up with you and hopefully We'll be hearing obviously some of the, some news of obviously fight fighting and obviously back in Ireland very soon. Definitely. Cheers, Leonard. Take care. All right, mate. Take Thank it you. easy. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye.